I do want to join in in welcoming those who are visiting with us. We do have some visitors this morning, and we're thankful for your presence. We invite you to open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 17. It'll be the text for our lesson this morning. We meet four times each week. We meet for two periods of Bible study and two periods of worship. Three times on Sunday and one time on Wednesday night. There are a few other times with the young people meeting for devotionals and uh, those that are older meeting for a class on Wednesday morning. Um, But the four service times, three on Sunday and one on Wednesday night. And there are individuals, of course, who attend only one of those four. And if it is the case that a person attends only one of the four services that we have each week, it is generally the case that they attend the Sunday morning worship. And so that's the reason for the lesson uh, this morning being presented at uh, this hour. I have, over the years, tried to think and try to analyze why individuals are more prone to attend Sunday morning worship Uh, than they are any other service. And it seems to me that it probably is tied into the communion in some way. It may be that they deem the Sunday morning worship the most important service of all. And they may deem it as most important because that is the hour when all of the saints participate in the communion of the Lord's death. And there are individuals who elevate the communion above the other acts of worship. In fact, I have even known those down through the years who believed that their worship was complete uh, once they had commemorated the Lord's death. I have known those who would observe the Lord's Supper and then would leave after having done that. Perhaps you have known of those individuals as well. But you and I know that Worship is not made up of one act, but rather worship is made up of five acts. And each of the acts of worship is on an equal par of importance. One is not more important than another. None of them can be dispensed with and our worship be acceptable to God. I have known of congregations that have moved the commemoration of the Lord's death, the Lord's Supper, to the end of the service in hopes that individuals would sit through the other acts of worship before that act was observed. And I suppose that maybe there is some wisdom in that. There may be the wisdom in that because we've been through a period of worship. Our minds ought to be better prepared in commemorating the Lord's death and having taken stock of ourselves having listened to the Word of God, and so there may be some wisdom in doing it that way. And there may even be the thought in our minds that perhaps during the course of a worship service we might change them, and we might convince them of the importance of these other acts of worship. And if so, then that's commendable, and I'm thankful at least we're putting forth the effort to try to make those changes within them. But over time, individuals will simply come late. They simply will come in halfway through the service. They learn when the communion is going to be observed, and so they just make sure that they're there by that time. I have known of other congregations that have moved the worship service to the first service and then had Bible study to follow that in an effort to get people to the building early. And the hope hope was that they would stay for worship, and then because they were already there, they would stay for Bible class. But again, that often proves ineffective. Because the problem isn't the hour. The problem is the heart. The problem is the heart. And if we can change the heart, then all of these problems go away. Because people will do the right thing because they want to do it. Because they love the Lord and they want to be pleasing to Him and they want to serve Him. But maybe there are some other reasons why individuals tend to elevate the Sunday morning worship above the other services of the Lord's Church each week. It may be the case that the Sunday morning worship is simply more convenient to them than what the others are. After all, it's not too early and it's not too late. 
You have time to get up in the morning and have your coffee and read the newspaper and do what you want to do and still be able to be here for the worship hour. And so it may be that it's more convenient, and that may be why it is preferred above the other services. It is before the football games, and so you still have all afternoon to do what you want to do. Maybe that's why individuals choose the Sunday morning worship over something else. But think about as well that it may be that it simply takes one service to soothe their conscience. And because this is the service when all the saints observe the Lord's Supper, then this would be the service that they would choose to soothe their conscience. If this truly is the most important service, as some would, would argue, then if I participate in it, then I have fulfilled my duty. My conscience can be clear, and therefore I do not have to be present for the other services that will take place uh, during the week. We need to understand that a person has to want to do the right thing. We can't force them to do the right thing. We can simply encourage them or help them to do the right thing. It may be that they can soothe their conscience in that one service, and they also can, because they attend that service when more people are present, they, they can be recognized as a member simply for having a attended that one service. It's enough to claim membership and be recognized as a member if they attend that one service. It may also be the case that if they will attend that one service, then the elders won't come to visit them, the preacher won't come to visit them, there will be no faith in action visits assigned because after all, they are attending at least one service of the Lord's church. I don't know all the reasons because I attend all four and most of you attend all four and so it's hard for me to understand the logic behind attending only one. But I know that some do it and perhaps those are reasons why they do it. But whatever the reason may be that you have for attending just one of the four services, it's not right. In fact, it is a sin to forsake the assembly of the saints together. The Bible so defines it. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Bible says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, even so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the Bible tells us very plainly not to forsake the assembling, the coming together of ourselves. We're not to forsake that. We're supposed to be there. We know as well that the Bible commands us to be in submission to the elders. We are to obey those that have the rule over us. We are to submit to them, realizing that they watch for our souls, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. And it's our elders who have set aside the four service times that we have. And so we are to obey them. We are to submit to them. And in fact, if we do not obey them, and if we do not submit to them, we are not only in rebellion to them, but we are in rebellion to God. Because they are ordained of God for this work. They have been appointed for this work. They have met the qualifications of God, therefore they are God approved, and we must obey them. And if we do not, it is the same as disobeying God. It is the same as rebelling against God. And so that's as simple as I know how to put it. It's a sin. It's a rebellion against God. It's a rebellion against the elders not to attend the services of the Lord's church. But this morning's lesson is not going to be designed to be a rebuke in that sense. It's going to be more designed to reason with you. It's going to be more designed to convince you as to why you ought to be present for all the services, to try to convince you of the value of being present for both Bible studies and both worship services. And we want to use Matthew chapter 17 as the text for that. Matthew chapter 17, as you may recall, is the transfiguration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter, James, and John were with him on that mount, 
and they saw him transfigured on that occasion. And it was on that occasion that Peter declared, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now, there were some things that Peter said on that mount that were not wise and were not good. In fact, he was rebuked for some things that he said. But he was not rebuked for this. He was right about this. It was good for them to be there. And it is good for us to be here this morning. And we will see a parallel that exists in this context between reasons why it was good for them to be there and why it is good for us to be here. First of all, I want you to consider this. It was good for them to be there because the Lord was there. These disciples wanted to be where the Lord was. We know Peter, James, and John as the inner circle. They were with Jesus at times when no one else was there. They wanted to be close to Jesus. They wanted to be with Him. And where Jesus was, they wanted to be. And Jesus was in the mount, and they wanted to be with Him. And they were with Him on this occasion. The text tells us that Jesus taketh them up into the mount. They are there with Him. And that's where they want to be. They want to be there because the Lord is there. You know, it is good for us always to be where the Lord is. I can't imagine any place we would rather be than where the Lord is. I can't imagine anyone who loves Him or who serves Him or who wants to please Him who would want to be anywhere other than with Him. And these disciples were there because He was there, and they wanted to be with Him. But think about the parallel situation to us. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Have you ever thought about the fact that there were three on that Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. You can look around this morning. We've got more than three here. In fact, I guess every pew has more than, well, we have one pew here. Two there, three here. Most pews have more than two or three on them. Number of people here. Is Jesus here this morning? He is. He promised He would be. Why is it good for us to be here? Well, it's good for us to be here because Jesus is here. Jesus is not at your house this morning. Not in the way that He's here. Jesus is not at the restaurant this morning. Not in the way that He's here. I know God's everywhere. I understand that. But He's promised in a very special way to be with us in worship. And it is good for us to be here because He's here. And we ought to want to be with Him. Think about Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, and Jesus had told His disciples that He would not drink it again with them until He drank it anew with them in the kingdom. And the kingdom is here this morning. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper, and He's going to drink it with us. We're going to commemorate His death. We're going to remember what He did. And He is going to be here as we do that. He is going to be communing with us as we do that. Just as He communed with those disciples in the long ago, He is communing with us this morning. The cup still represents His blood. The bread still represents His broken body. And He is there. He is here observing it with us as He was there observing it with them. What a special thing it is for us to be here because the Lord is here. You may remember in John chapter 20 and verse 24 that when Jesus first appeared to the disciples after His resurrection, that they were gathered together in that room, but there was one who was not there. Thomas, we're told, was not there. Thomas missed out on the opportunity to be with the Lord because he wasn't there. I don't know why Thomas wasn't there. But I know the next time he was there, I know Thomas corrected it, whatever it was. And I know that Thomas didn't want to miss it again. And so it may be the case that it has been your history not to be here. Can't change the past. 
But you can certainly alter the future, can't you? And you can determine, I've missed being with the Lord in the past, but I'm going to be with the Lord in the future. Whenever the Lord is there with His disciples, I want to be there. I want to be there because the Lord's there, and I don't want to miss being with Him. You think about the fact that Thomas suffered longer than the other disciples did over the death of Jesus because he wasn't with the disciples. They had the good news and they saw the Lord before Thomas did. Thomas had to wait because it wasn't there on that occasion. He missed something by not being there and we missed something by not being here. We missed being with the Lord. But in the second place, consider that it was good for them to be there because faithful brethren were there. Think about who went up into the mount on this occasion. Jesus went up and they got to be with him. But we see that Peter, James, and John got to be together. Now we often see them together. They were very close to one another. They enjoyed a very special fellowship. And they got to be together in that mount. Now, granted, being together with one another wasn't as great as being with the Lord. But it wasn't bad either. It was a blessing as well. They got to be with those who were as close to the Lord as they were. They got to be with those that were committed to the Lord as much as they were. They got to be with those who were doing the same work that they were doing. They got to be together. They got to enjoy this fellowship with one another. It was good for them to be there because they got to be together. And in like manner, it is good for us to be here this morning because we get to be together. We get to be together with those of like mind, like heart. We get to be with, together with those who want to be just as close to the Lord, who are just as committed to the Lord, who are just as involved in the work of the Lord as what we are. There's nowhere else where we can do that. We get the opportunity to do that this morning, to be together with faithful brethren. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, as we've already noted, the Hebrew writer says, not forsaking, notice this, the assembling of ourselves together. You see, the first century church came together. They came together to be with the Lord, but they also came together to be with one another. In fact, they were considering one another. They were provoking one another. They were exhorting one another to come to this meeting because they wanted to be together. They needed to be together. It was good for them to be together. And so in Hebrews 10, 25, they were assembling for that very reason. And they were to be aware of the fact that some had the manner, some had the habit of not being there. But they didn't want to be like them. They wanted to come together. They wanted to be with faithful brethren. That ought to be the desire of our hearts also. Think about Acts chapter 2. This is the day the church was established. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we find following that, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, and in fellowship and in prayers. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They kept coming together. They were together on Pentecost Day when they were converted, and they kept coming together. Following Pentecost Day, they kept coming together to be with the Lord, and they kept coming together to be with one another. And they were with one accord, according to verse 46, in the temple and from house to house. They kept assembling because they needed to be with those of like precious faith. But think about also Acts 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when they were come together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to part on the morrow, and he continued his speech into midnight. Notice they were come together. Here's the early church assembling. We ought to want to be here. It is good for us to be here because faithful brethren are here. But in the third place, it was good for them to be there because they were free from distractions there. Notice that verse 1 of Matthew 17 says that Jesus took them up into a mountain apart. I suppose that Jesus could have been transfigured anywhere. I don't think he had to be on a mountain for that to happen. 
but he selected a mountain for it to take place. Some of the greatest events of the Bible took place on mountains. Here's another one of those events. It takes place on a mountain. It's a high mountain. There's a great distance between where they are and where the city or the village is. It's a place that is apart. It's a place that has some distance between it and the world. You see, they're away from the clamor and the confusion of the city. They're away from the hustle and bustle of daily life. They're apart in a high place. I ask you, what is worship? Is it not a part in a high place? Is that not what worship is? Is worship not getting to a position to where we're removed from common everyday events of life? That we get away from the clamor and the confusion and the crowds? where we can focus on something far more important than what we do during the week. Something that has to do with our souls rather than just with our bodies. Something that's of a higher purpose. Something that has more meaning to it than that. These disciples had the opportunity to do that. Now, if you read through the Gospels, and I hope you do on a regular basis, then you know that Jesus often went apart personally. That was his habit, to find a secluded, a separate place where he could pray and commune with his Father. There were times when the crowd pressed on Jesus so much and his disciples so much that they couldn't move. You remember this story about those who were bringing a paralyzed friend to Jesus and because of the crowds, they couldn't even get to the door. They had to climb up on the roof and tear off part of the roof to lower their friend down. That was the situation that Jesus was often in. That's a hard situation to pray in. That's a hard situation to commune with your Father in. So Jesus found a place apart where he could do that. And he taught that habit to his disciples as well. And he often took them apart to teach them things and so that they could worship. I will suggest to you that today worship is our time apart. Worship is our time away from the ordinary affairs of life. And we need that. And it's good for us to be here because we have the opportunity to find that in worship. It's an interesting passage in Luke 21 and verse 34 where Jesus talked about our hearts being overcharged with the affairs of this life. The affairs of this life can overcharge us. They can overwhelm us to the extent to where we don't focus and we don't think about the things that we ought to be focused on and we ought to be thinking about. Someone says, well, couldn't you worship in your house? Have you ever thought about that just in practical terms? We're commanded to assemble, so that's not even an option. But Is your telephone going to ring here this morning? Not if you listen to the announcements, right? Turned it off. It'll probably ring right now. Somebody's about to go off, probably. We don't have that interference, do we? Is someone likely to come by here looking for you this morning? Knocking on the door right out there? No, probably not. What if you were home? Does your phone ring when you're home? People come by and knock on your door when you're home. Sure, you get those distractions, don't you, when you're at home. We're free from those distractions right here. We have other distractions when we're at home that we don't have when we're in the confines of this building. It's good for us to be here. Because we get away from the distractions of the world. We get away from people who don't care anything about these things and we find ourselves in the middle of people who have made this their life. Oh, how wonderful that is. That's what the disciples found there in that mount. 
In Acts chapter 27, Paul is on a voyage to Rome. He's warned them not to be on this voyage. It's a dangerous time for sailing, but they're sailing anyway. But there are occasions in that context, verse 4 is an example, where they sailed under certain islands. And that may not make sense to you unless you understand something about sailing and unless you understand something about what they were doing. And when they sailed under these islands, literally for the, for the length of that island, they were out of the wind. They had time to get things back in shape again. They had, they had time to rest before they went back out in the open water again. And they had to face the winds again. Do you realize how important these services are to your spiritual survival? Do you know how long a ship can survive if it's exposed day in and day out to the wind and to the waves without any rest and without any time for recovery? Oh, it can't last very long under those circumstances. How long are we going to last if we don't have these opportunities to get out from the wind and to get out from the world and to focus on spiritual things alone? We're not going to make it very long. We need that. And the Bible has made, and the elders have made, allowance for us to be able to do that. But consider a fourth reason why it was good for them to be there. It was good for them to be there because Jesus was magnified there. Not only was Jesus there, that's a reason in and of itself, but Jesus was magnified there. In verse 2, we find that Jesus was transfigured before them. They saw the raiment change. They saw his appearance change. They saw Jesus lifted up. They saw Jesus magnified. And it was good for them to see that. Because Jesus wasn't just the carpenter's son. He was more than that. He was the Son of God. And they needed to see Jesus magnified. We need to see Jesus magnified. And it is in worship, it is when His people come together that He is magnified. And we need to see Him that way. We need to see Him lifted up. We need to see how glorious He is. We need to see and hear of His purity. We need to see the magnified Christ. Oh, so often in the world, Jesus is blasphemed. So often in the world, Jesus is trodden underfoot. That's the Jesus that we see so often during the week. We hear people use His name in vain and to curse. Oh, that's the Jesus and how He's treated in the world. But when we come to worship, He isn't treated that way anymore. No, He's lifted up. And we see Him in His glory and we see Him in His purity. And that's the way we need to see Him. If we live in the world all the time, we may begin to see Him and treat Him the same way the world does. But we need to be removed from that. And to see Him treated as God wants Him treated. And that's in worship. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he speaks of Jesus by the right hand of God, exalted. That's the Jesus they saw on Pentecost. They saw... Jesus exalted. And that's what we're trying to do in our worship this morning. We're trying to exalt Jesus. And we ought to want to be in places where the Lord is magnified, and we ought to want not to be in places where the Lord is blasphemed. It's good for us to be here because the Lord is magnified here. There are a number of more reasons, and we don't have time to get into them this morning. But we want to get into them tonight. And I know the danger of this, and I had to do a lot of thinking about this. And I had to think, you know, there are some people who only come on Sunday morning. And so if I don't preach the whole sermon on Sunday morning, they're only going to get the first four reasons. They're not going to get the other ones. Then I thought, you know, if the first four reasons don't convince them, probably if I went long covering the other four or five, it wouldn't convince them either. But I hope this morning that in these reasons alone, with your understanding that there are more reasons, that your heart is soft, 
your heart is responsive to the teaching of the Scriptures, that you understand that it's good to be here. It's good to be here because the Lord's here. It's good to be here because faithful brethren are here. It's good to be here because the world isn't here, at least not in large measure. And it is good to be here because the Lord is magnified here. And I hope tonight that you will return. And we'll talk about from the context some additional reasons why it's good to be here. And I know tonight that I may be preaching to those who are here every service. But you know, we need to be reminded that it's good to be here too. Because we're just one service away from being like those who only come to one service, aren't we? You know, if you skip one service, it's easier to skip another one. And if you skip another one, it's easier to skip yet another. And before you know it, it almost gets hard to come back again. Because after all, you've been away for so long. But I assure you this morning that if you've been away, whether it be one time or a hundred times, you'll find a warm reception awaiting you. The angels of heaven will rejoice. The Father will run to meet you. And those who are faithful to the Lord will gather around you to receive you back again. You know your habits. You know why you are here or not here better than anyone else does. Here's the opportunity for you to make that right. Do you believe this morning that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and do you believe that with all of your heart? Romans 10, 9 and 10. Are you willing to repent and turn away from every sin? Luke 13, 3 and 5. Will you confess before men? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37, and then be immersed in water to have every sin removed, Acts 2 and verse 38. But as a child of God, if you've been unfaithful, will you come home and be faithful again, faithful in attendance, faithful in life, faithful in every aspect and area of your life? If you'll come home confessing your sin and repenting of them, God is faithful and He is just and He will forgive your sins. Will you come and put yourself before Him this morning as we stand and as we sing?